The world is in a continual pattern of decline, but not a constant one. Continual, but not constant. Regular, but not persistent. From the fall into sin, from the Garden of Eden on down, history works in these steps. We level off. Occasionally, we might even take a step back. Sometimes things bounce up a little bit before getting worse. But at that moment that we were created, when all things were meant for life and love, eternity, for all perfection, all the time, from the fall into sin, that eternity becomes less. Oh, Adam and Eve lived for 900 years, but that is infinitely less than eternity. Their descendants would progressively live fewer and fewer years overall. Worse yet, their son would be a murderer of their other son. Because of the fall into sin, everything begins to degrade. The lifespan of the human race, the health of the human race, the moral health of humanity and everything that exists in nature, by the way, all those things that were under the dominion of man who was made in God's image, by the fall into sin, everything begins this inexorable decline. Keeping this in mind and keeping this in context is pivotal to our understanding of our place in the universe, of knowing exactly what our vocation is and how to value things and how to devalue other things. Having our priorities correct is knowing our place in eternity. Look at the days of Solomon. Solomon, who was given the gift of building the temple, the design of which, the idea of which, originates with the great David. Could it get any better than David bequeathing to Solomon a kingdom and that during the reign of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel, the empire of Israel, really, would reach its furthest extent of its boundaries, of its wealth. Untold riches fill the kingdom. Everything is good and glorious. How couldn't you be happy to live in the days of Solomon? But like always, the word of God from the beginning of time till this moment continues acting in the world, revealing himself to those to whom it is entrusted. The word of God manifests to the prophets, and to their shock and dismay, at the time when everything is going really, really great, God starts telling them about how he's going to save them from all the wretched misery and decay of the kingdom in which they live. Because God knows what's on the horizon when we don't. This pattern went on before the time of David and Solomon. Abraham being brought out of Ur, being given his own land, flocks and herds and the growth of his family to end up in slavery in Egypt. To be brought out of Egypt by God with a mighty hand to your own land to fight with pagans, intermarry with them and take on their false religion. David takes over from Saul, bequeaths everything to Solomon and now finally we can live happily ever after. But the word of God comes again and says, after the misery and wretched suffering of your brokenness is over, I will lead you home. The kingdom splits at the death of Solomon between the northern and the southern kingdoms. But still, there's a reasonable amount of prosperity, isn't there? A reasonable amount of, of security. The saddest of all of them is at the end of a series of horrible, idol-worshipping kings and decay for the whole culture when Josiah becomes king. The boy King Josiah sets his whole life to fixing everything, restoring the values of the kingdom, its morals, its scruples, its laws, its religion, above all, faith in God Almighty. And the word of God comes to the prophet saying, Behold, destruction is coming in the morning and great wrath for all of your evil and idolatry. Like, really? It, aren't things wonderful? But things weren't wonderful because of people. In the days of Solomon, those who were selfish and greedy, the ones who rejected the word of God and had their doubts or didn't believe in him at all, the ones who wanted to be more like the world, well, they were already there, thinking and planning and conspiring together with one another and in their hearts. It may not have been obvious to the world. It wasn't going to appear on the news, but God knew. Therefore, God knew what was coming. 
the great heroic saint Josiah who dies defending his nation after spending a lifetime purifying everything changed nothing because the hearts of his people remained corrupt. So they buried all their false gods in the backyard and prayed over the spot and looked forward to the day when this king would die and they could set up idols to their false gods again. They in their hearts had not changed. There was no great resurgence of values or morals or faith in life. It was the same old. And so the word of God comes to Amos, the prophet, at a time when things are still reasonably peaceful and prosperous and good. And God says, go and tell my people after they are broken and defeated and crushed and taken away to captivity, someday I promise I will bring them back. This is the news received by the prophet of God, a disaster impending, the promise of God that he will rescue them after the thing you didn't even know was on the horizon because that's how it works, and so on and so forth, to captivity in Babylon and back, to captivity, to occupation and conquest by the Greeks, to occupation by the Romans because of your own incompetent rulers, on and on through the centuries. You and I, as Christian people, called into vocation in this world. We have all these responsibilities and duties to church, to Christ, to his doctrine, to our family, to our spouse, to our children, to our country, to our community. But understanding the transitory nature of all of it, family and loved ones can fail us. Family and loved ones can betray the faith of Jesus Christ and end up outside the kingdom. Our nation, like all nations before it, comes and goes. Those great patriotic Christians who witnessed the fall of Rome and thought it was the end of the world. We forget about them too often because the movies focus on the pagan era. Christian legions who died to the last man to defend a Christian nation from barbarians coming over the hill. They had every reason to be proud, and who remembers them? It was their vocation, it was their duty, and there was nothing unglorious about it. But they went to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which lasts forever. The kingdoms in this world don't. That's the perspective that eternity gives us when living in time, when the fall into sin and those steps help us to remember our job, our duty, our calling, our obligations and vocations in this world are to do the best we can with what we're given right now. We will never build a utopia. There is no perfect nation, perfect world, perfect set of circumstances in this fallen creation. There is nothing perfect until the next world. There is some better than others. There is doing the best that we can. There is be, having the vocation of defending our family, our loved ones, our community, our country, but having our faith in the correct place, the kingdom of Jesus Christ being revealed into the world, that place where he reigns in eternity right now, that church that is mentioned in the creeds, the church that is truly Catholic, Orthodox, universal, right teaching, the church that exists there in Revelation when we see him on his throne, the church that is there right now at this instant in that place, but is also here manifested in the things like the wedding feast at Cana. God who takes us empty vessels, we clay pots, and fills us up with the water of his baptism, who turns that into the water to the blood of his Eucharist as his body and blood cometh here. The God who finds us sinful, broken vessels that we made ourselves by the fall into sin, but is restoring us even as the steps go down to the end of this world, God who is working to re-enliven, quicken, to resurrect, to make us new, to transfigure us, who by his suffering death on the cross has taken away the guilt of our sin, canceled out the debt of original sin, canceled out the sin, the debt of all sin we have ever done and ever will do, of every sinner who has ever lived and ever will live, the totality of all sin nailed to the cross and drained with his divine and human blood, that which has been atoned for and removed, 
so that he can be at work in us, making us new. The wedding feast is the first miracle in the Gospels of his earthly ministry. The wedding feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which is referenced in every Eucharistic liturgy. The wedding feast that he attends on earth that symbolically signifies the one that is coming, the thing that he has come to do, the six pots of water, the six days of creation, now filled with the water over which his spirit hovered, taking us vessels that he made, Jesus making us in his image back there in the garden as he walked in the cool of the day, restoring all things. This is what his ministry on earth is for. This is where his first miracle happens at the wedding feast, pointing again and again to baptismal regeneration, to the Eucharist, to the celebration of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. That, in its perfection, its timelessness, that which is reaching into this world as a great net, fishing towards him all those that can be snagged by the Holy Ghost, dragging us inerringly to eternal life. This was his mission. This is the mission. This is the whole conception of sacramental life, of being engrafted into the body of Jesus Christ. Only by this do we escape the cycle of the steps. And at the final level, the final step down, at the judgment day it is coming, all who believe in him and trust in his regeneration all have that eternal life, that healing, the undoing of the entire curse when everything is reversed, everything is rewound, everything is made new, everything is made again, and everything becomes permanent. That is our kingdom. That is our empire. That is our nation. That is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the one on the throne who never dies, the one that has no end, the one that is eternal, restoring us back to the perfection we lost at the beginning. That is what we look forward to, where our faith life is rooted. Everything here, as good or bad as it may be, however glorious, however stupefying, everything here and now is temporary and only shadows and dust compared to that glorious recreation at his coming. In Jesus' name, amen.